Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our call on the lymphatic system. Um, <clears throat> boy, this is an important topic uh, in Ayurveda. The, uh, one of the eight branches of Ayurveda is actually called Rasayana. And Rasayana um, is the study of longevity. And the word rasa uh, and ayana, ayana means the study of, and rasa is what they're studying. And rasa is what Ayurveda calls lymph. Um, uh, the word rasa is also used for emotion, and it's also used for taste. It's also a word used for love, nutrient fluid. Um, even the menses and the sperm are, are in some cases called uh, rasa. This rasa is such an important fluid in the body, and it's a pervasive fluid that actually, from the Ayurvedic perspective, actually supports the function of all the other tissues in the body. Now, I know from a Western perspective, that makes zero sense. Um, but from an Ayurvedic perspective, it makes some pretty interesting good sense. And I want to share with you uh, what I can about the Ayurvedic understanding of lymph, and then talk to you a little bit about the Western understanding of lymph and see if we can you know, make some connections. There's, there's no doubt that the lymphatic system um, from the Western perspective is a huge circulatory system. It's larger than the arterial system and the venous system. It is the system that drains most of the waste out of the body. In between all the cells is this interstitial extracellular fluid, and that is the lymph. As the blood pumps from your heart, goes into smaller arterioles and then capillaries, and then the plasma, the fluid of the blood, oozes into the intercellular spaces, and that becomes the lymphatic fluid. In that fluid, in the lymphatic system, um, is our immune system. In fact, our white blood cells are made also in the bone marrow and in the lymphatic system. There's over 500 lymph nodes in the body that are little super kind of white blood cell concentration spots that super attack any weird foreign agent that shouldn't be there. So the lymph system, this is all from the Western perspective, starts inside your intestinal tract right next to the villi in your small intestine called lacteals. And the job of the lymph from the Western perspective starts right there. The job of the lymph from the Ayurvedic perspective starts soon as you see or smell or taste the food. So it's a, a way upstream. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the lymph in the intestinal tract, the lacteals, is what pulls off many of the nutri nutrients off the intestinal wall, many of the proteins um, off the well off the intestinal wall, and all of the fats in the intestinal wall. A lot of proteins shouldn't actually penetrate through the lymphatic system because they're a bit like gluten, for example. It's too large of a molecule to penetrate the, the semipermeable membrane of the intestinal wall. But sometimes when you get irritants like gluten or other hard to digest proteins, which should have been broken down upstream, and they find their way into the intestinal tract and they irritate the villi, they separate the villi, they go into your lymphatic system and they cause a host of problems. The lymph system's job is to move proteins back into the blood, into circulation, so it can get back into the bloodstream system. If those proteins become excessive, they can become allergenic, and we can cause hypersensitive reactions. And that's what causes most of the allergies that we see. The job, one of the major jobs of the lymph is to move those proteins out of the intercellular fluid, the interstitial fluid, intercellular fluid, and bring it back to circulation. If that didn't happen, just that one piece about the protein, then we would be dead in 24 hours. So that is a pretty critical piece. In addition, the fats are, from according to, you know, and, and I think what we're learning Western-wise about the lymph is changing dramatically. So much of it, people really, the science doesn't really know yet. But what they do know um, is that, the, that almost all the fats are pulled off the intestinal wall through the lymphatic system. So its job is to pull off the fats. And that means 
good fats, bad fats, toxic fats. So it's very, very important for the, for the lymphatic system to be functioning because, first of all, in a toxic world, we have you know, toxic chemicals, environmental pollutants, pesticides, preservatives, all of which are, are fatty. They are very difficult to be processed, so the lymph system is the processing system. So that's sort of how it works as it goes into the lymph, that stuff moves through the lymph. If the lymph is um, overwhelmed by proteins because the intestinal walls gotten irritated, if the lymph is overwhelmed by toxic fats, the lymph system can get congested. When it gets congested in a circulatory sense, a lot of yucky things can happen. You can get allergies, you can become feeling heavy, lethargic, tired, your rings can get tight on your fingers, your ankles can swell. When you lie in bed all night long, the lymph literally pools because the lymph system isn't connected to the heart, which pumps blood and venous drainage out of the body. The, the, the lymph system is connected to muscular contraction. So if you're lying in bed, the lymph tends to pool, and if there's any congestion in the lymphatic system, you can feel that pooling first thing in the morning. And when you get up in the morning, you feel stiff or achy, your feet hurt, you have to sort of walk it off to the sleep and get your body moving. Stiffness or achiness first thing in the morning is a classic sign of lymphatic congestion. Achy joints that moves around your body from one joint to the next is a classic sign of lymphatic congestion. Um, you know, like I said, tiredness, rashes on your skin. We have this lymph called skin-associated lymph. So underneath my skin, I have a lymph layer, which is an immune layer that is waiting for any weird thing to bite me. And if any little bacteria or something gets through my skin into my blood, I produce a lymphatic immune response right there. I get a little redness and it's all taken care of. And I don't have become, this doesn't become a systemic infection. Um, so that's what my skin associated lymph is all about. I'm gonna stop here for a second and talk about that. Um, <clears throat> because the skin is like hugely important. Uh, the quality of your skin supports the quality of your lymph. And many of you have gone for lymphatic massages and you, it's a very gentle touching of the lymph to move the skin associated lymph. It's a very important part of lymph, but it's not the only part of the lymph. We have what's called gut associated lymph, the lymph around your belly. That's what makes your belly bloat and swell. And you get a big baby belly after a meal and then it goes down, it goes up. That's lymph. You're not gaining weight, losing weight, getting fat, losing fat. It's lymph that's swelling and deswelling as you in digest or indigest. Uh, we have what's called respiratory or mucous membrane or larynx associated lymph, which has to do with the lymph on the other side of your respiratory tract. Again, Anywhere you have skin, epithelium, inner or outer skin, here is skin or inside your gut skin or inside your respiratory tract skin, you're gonna have a lymphatic layer waiting as an immune sort of all your emergency vehicles out there waiting in case something bad happens, boom, they go there. But if the lymph is, stuck, is congested and boggy and static or therefore stuck in traffic, your immune system can't get there on time and it creates a emergency response, a hypersensitive response, an alarm inflammatory response. So the lymph system is the first system that we use to process waste, to deliver fats and process fats to, for, for, uh, for, for the brain, for the skin, for the, the, the cholesterols, which are all about the, the cell walls. I mean, we really need a lymphatic system. And so it's about protein and fat absorption and assimilation. And, and those are two very, very important things. Your skin, interestingly, uh, just like the skin on the inside of your gut wall, uh, on the outside of your skin has microbes. And the microbes, um, they actually, in your gut and even on your skin, they have a, a, a job to do to manufacture inside your gut vitamins, uh, neurotransmitters, hormones, they do the heavy lifting for your entire immune system. They keep the villi super happy and healthy and the lacteals for your lymph are right there. And if those villi are happy, those lacteals are happy, you've got a great absorption assimilated system. And if that's not working good, then toxins will build up in the intestinal tract, congest your lymph, cause all those lymphatic congestive issues. And the problem with that is that's like the first thing that goes wrong. Kids have lymphatic-y, are lymphy, 
They make mucus for a living. They get swollen glands. They get earaches. They get sore throats. They make a lot of mucus. They hold on to more water. They're puffier. They're elastic. They're, they, they, so they don't dry out and break when they grow. This is the nature. We call it kapha in Ayurveda. It's the, it's the mucus making time of their life so they can expand and grow. And therefore, it's, a, it's a con, more of a congestive time of their life. So, so when, the, when the kids get congested, they get a lot of lymphy or lymphatic issues. So it's very important to realize that the lymphatic system drains the skin. And if the skin is being drained, inner and outer, then the villi on the skin can function in an optimal manner, making the neurotransmitters, boosting immunity. And if that sort of goes wacky, some bad things can happen. So the lymph is so pervasive, really, when you look at it. Uh, I'm a big fan of healing your skin by putting oil on the surface of your skin. Uh, we use a, a massage oil, uh, a lymphatic massage oil, which uh, has herbs like mangista cooked into the oils. The oils feed the microbes on your skin. The oils carry the herbs that can penetrate through the phospholipid layer of your skin. The oils generally can't do that on their own. The oils act as a pulling effect. They sit on your skin. They're lipophilic. They pull toxins through your skin and they trigger a lymphatic cleansing of the skin associated lymph by sort of helping to increase the exercising of the skin, which means the transit time for the yuck, the dead skin to move through the layers of the skin and be sloughed off is what's called the transit time of the skin, or we call it exercise in your skin to make that happen faster. Oils tend to do that for the body. So when you put oil on your skin, they go in the shower, put oil up your whole body with a really good herbalized lymphatic oil. The oil sits on your skin, starts to pull. The herbs penetrate through the phospholipid layer because they're water soluble. And, and, and that allows them to go through and they pull the impurities out through the skin. They nourish the skin, nourish the lymph. And then after the shower, while you're in the shower and it gets really warm and everything vasodilates, you scrub it all off and wash it off like with a washcloth and you kind of exfoliate all the yuck and toxins and fat soluble things that have been pulled through the skin. Very cool thing. Um, the same exact thing happens inside your intestinal tract when you do like a cleanse, like in our Ayurvedic cleanses, the Shortum cleanse, the Colorado cleanse. When you take ghee inside your intestinal tract, it's exactly the same thing. Matter of fact, we have studies to back that up. Studies show that when you take ghee inside, it pulls heavy metals and environmental pollutants off your gut wall, and it continues to do so for three months after the cleanse is done. So it's a chelating effect, sort of a lipophilic pulling effect that's been somewhat well documented. Oil pulling is another Ayurvedic technique where they do that and they pull the, uh, the oil on your mouth, swishing, pulls impurities off the, uh, off the uh, oral mucosa. Now, we haven't seen these studies show it actually pulls it off the oral mucosa. We've seen studies that pull it off the gut, but it's the same old rule that Ayurveda keeps applying. Put it on your skin, put it in your mouth, put it in your nose, we're talking oil in your ears. I mean, pretty much any orifice that Ayurveda has discovered, they generally put oil in it. And, and, and the reason for that is because it has a beneficial effect for the microbes because the bugs eat oil, and it has a pulling effect for any toxicity, which is just a really cool concept. So that is something for us to, to, be, uh, to be aware of. And um, when you put oil on your skin, there, there's, you know, massaging, there's great benefit there to help your skin function as an organ. And when you put ghee inside your intestinal tract, like who knew, right? Your intestinal tract has bugs in it, one called Clostridium butyricum. Butyricum comes from the word butter. That's how a butter got its name. And literally there's microbes in your gut that make butter or ghee for a living, that's their job, is to make butter and ghee. Our intestinal wall uses the butyric acid, the ghee, which is the highest concentration of butyric acid on the planet. It uses it to support the strength of the intestinal cells, the immunity, and all your bugs feed on it, or many of the bugs feed on it. So it's like how they knew Ayurvedically that this ghee that you put inside your gut has this incredible effect on healing the intestinal mucosa to support the lacteals of the villi of the intestinal wall and therefore the lymphatic system. And of course, support the microbiology, which supports the lymph. So that's sort of really, I think, an interesting understanding. And of course, if that isn't working, all those toxins that should go through your lymph, 
because they're all fat soluble, right? They could default back to your liver. And your liver is going, whoa, I just dumped all that yuck into my, into my uh, intestinal tract to be processed. And why is it not in the lymph? And why is it back here? The liver gets congested. And that is another lecture. But that starts to de de, you know, kind of derail all of our digestive strength, including digesting, hard to digest things like gluten and dairy, which are a super big topic. Now, that's sort of like the Western slash Ayurvedic understanding of the lymph. Most of that is pretty well documented, what I just said. What Ayurveda knows is that, which I think is you know, also really interesting, is that Ayurveda knows that, or said that, as soon as you smell the food, see the food, or taste the food, um, you're creating an emotional charge on the very subtle fluid, which is called rasa. And that fluid, before it becomes even the lymph fluid, it's called sara, so a little technical, but that, so let's say you're really angry and you're really upset and you sit down to eat the food. That emotion of the anger is going to be impregnated into the food and the microbes on the food. And it's also going to be impregnated into your sara or your very early stages of your what's called nutrient fluid or your rasa or your very early lymph fluid, okay? So there's a very early stage lymph fluid, lymphatic fluid called sara, which becomes the, the rasa in your stomach. The sara is in your, in your nose, in your taste buds. It's in, and, and, and maybe it's microbial. You know, Ayurveda didn't say what this fluid was made of, but we, here's what we know. Science says that what you see, you become, which means that if you are watching CNN and watching people being beheaded and it's one trauma and stress after another, after another, after another, that stress impacts your microbiology. Studies have shown if you take a container of yogurt, put it on a table, have an emotional you know, outcry or yell, scream, that the bugs, the microbes in that yogurt will dramatically change based on that emotion. Bugs feel those emotions. If you take the poop, fecal matter out of an anxious mouse and put it into a calm mouse, the calm mouse gets anxious. So it's our microbiology that carry our stress and our emotion and our mood. And we know that to be true because the, neuro, the bugs make the neurotransmitters to make the, moods, to make the mood stable or unstable. There's really good science to back that up. What we're beginning to understand is that the emotions that you have impact your microbiology on a sort of energetic level. These bugs are super sensitive to stress. So, and Ayurveda said that that stress, stay with me here, that that stress, when you're eating your food, is impregnated into the food, and on your food, if it's healthy, natural food, has bugs on it. Organic foods have way more bugs than conventional foods. If you don't cook your food and kill it, the bugs are alive. And when you're eating that food, you're eating the microbes that were attracted to that particular plant, the beet, the radish, whatever it was, has different microbes. And you can in charge those bugs with happy thoughts or sad thoughts. Am I, am I crazy here, sitting here saying we can charge our food with happy or sad thoughts? This, this, I, I, I'm stretching the science a little bit only because Ayurveda said this 5,000 years ago. And our whole thing in Ayurveda here at Lifespa is to prove ancient wisdom with modern science. And I'm telling you, the, the writing is on the wall. The subtleties that Ayurveda talked about for the last 5,000 years are coming true. They knew that what you see, you become. They knew that the stress that is processed through our intestinal tract, and only recently we found out that all the bugs are in your gut, and they are responsive to stress, and they are the second brain, and that's where it all happens. We know that Ayurveda says being sattvic, loving, kind, is a life-supporting process. And being angry, and needy, and resentful, and jealous, and, and, and withdrawn, and retreating is a, is a life degrading process. So Ayurveda said, let's try to engage in sattvic, loving, caring, kind behavior. We know that supports hormones like oxytocin that feed you and, and make you live and survive longer and have better relationships. And, it, and, and, and there's no end to how much oxytocin you can produce. 
We have a culture that is the exact opposite. We want a return on my investment. The more I, more I love you, I want to get love back. You know, if I make money, I want to buy a nice car. I want a return, and that makes me feel good. These are dopamine, I got to have it right now, hormone activators. And it's the more you stimulate it, the more stimuli you need. So we keep ratcheting up the things we do, must or make, to get satisfied. And that creates what we call rajasic behavior, stimulating behavior, and even aggressive behavior, which is not so good from the Ayurvedic perspective on our bugs. Now, what we know from the microbiological scientific world is like the first day of kindergarten, according to the researchers, is how much they don't know. But what we're finding out every day, and I, and I love keeping up on this research, is that they are affected by our emotions, they are affected by our mood, that they do change by what you see you become, that, that your epigenetically can change your, your genetic and your microbes by your behavior, by your environment. This affects, in Ayurveda, the rasa, the nutrient fluid, which can be impregnated by, impregnated by your emotion, by your attitude when you're eating your food. Don't eat when you're crazy stressed. Don't eat, drink a glass of water and go to bed, go for a walk. But that's not a good time to eat. From the Ayurvedic perspective, it's been said thousands of years ago. And now we're beginning to see sort of science behind that. Rasa, lymph, also means taste, right? So when you taste certain foods, like sweet taste makes you feel satisfied. You know what I mean? Bitter and, and, and are stimulating and pungent foods are stimulating. Every taste has a specific emotion. And I've written articles documenting the taste and what each taste, what the emotion for each taste is, what the emotions are if you have too much of those tastes, too little of those tastes. I've written about that. Please go to my web and, and watch those videos and read those. It's pretty fascinating. But the point is, is that what you taste has an emotional correlate. Thus the word rasa means taste, it means lymph, right? Um, so it's, so, and it also means emotion. Those are the three big things that this word rasa means. And the study of rasayana is the study of your taste, the study of your emotion, and the study of your lymph. Lymph being the big definer of the word rasa. So you sit down in a relaxed way, you eat your food, you emotion the food. And this, here we go, I can even get really crazy here, but from the Ayurvedic perspective, it's understood that whoever grew the food, whoever picked the food, whoever carried it to the market, and whoever cooked it has an emotion, is impregnating an emotional charge along the way. I'm telling you, Ayurveda gets really subtle. And I think what we're gonna find in the next 10 years, which is so exciting to be you know, reporting on all this research, we're gonna see that some of this subtlety is gonna bear out to be true. We know for a fact that when you are eating some food on your plate, you're eating the microbes that the person who picked the food had on their hands and everything they touched for the prior 18 hours. You're, you're, you're eating the microbes on the person who, who took it into the restaurant, who chopped it and cooked it, and anybody who touched along the way, you're eating the microbes that they experienced and touched for the last 18 hours or so, um, which is a lot of microbes. So when you think about it, and then all that goes into our intestinal tract, and all these bugs are multiplying sometimes as much as a million times in eight hours. They're multiplying so fast, and they're like totally figuring out this crazy world and allowing us to genetically adapt to this crazy world. And in Ayurveda, that all happens via the emotional charge, the energetic charge, the microbiological charge of our lymphatic fluid, which then goes into our, becomes our, our food bolus, and it's called the ahara rasa in our stomach. It's the food in our stomach with this emotional charge in it, right? And that emotional charge is super happy, good bugs proliferate. You get under a lot of stress, good bugs you know, you know, disappear and bad bugs proliferate. So we know that that's what happens. We know when you're under stress, the good bugs disappear and the bad bugs, you know, proliferate. So we don't want to be under stress, particularly when you're eating because it affects your lymph. And then that lymph goes into your small intestine and it breaks it down, the foods down further into micronutrients, which get absorbed through the lacteals into your lymphatic system. And here's where it gets even more subtle. And I'm and, and this is Ayurvedic philosophy for sure. That lymphatic fluid with certain enzymes 
actually begins to be the precursor to the production of the blood. Some of that lymph goes to the spleen, the spleen sort of helps, and bone marrow places begin to make the blood. But the lymph fluid is a precursor support for that process, Ayurvedically speaking. And then that blood turns into the, the production of muscle tissue, and then into fat tissue, into bone tissue, into uh, nerve tissue, and then into reproductive tissue. And along the way, there's, there are, uh, and this is what Ayurveda calls the 30-day process of digestion, okay? So in Ayurveda, digesting your food is not, um, isn't a, uh, you know, eat your food, you know, eat some beets and see how long it takes for your toilet to turn red, and maybe it's 12 hours or whatever it is. That isn't when the digestive system ends. In Ayurveda, it's the final stages of the nutrients from those beets that you ate, and it takes 30 days for that to complete. Along the way, every step of the way, the lymph, the rasa, turning into lymph, turning into blood, turning into muscle, the bone, fat, nerve, reproductive tissue, is a very vulnerable, susceptible process to stress. And when we get stressed out, that process is not as efficient. And the final, final product, in, 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 in addition to reproductive fluid to help us make more babies and keep the species alive, is a, process, a product called ojas. And ojas is this fluid that is called vitality fluid, immunity fluid. It makes you glow, radiant. They call it babies. When you see a baby all cherub-like and shiny, this is uh, uh, what we call ojas. And, and, and that, uh, that immunity and that robustness is what we call that fullness of ojas and uh, fully engaged in giving, caring, loving, all the oxytocin kind of things that we talk about. That's what ojas is. Um, nobody really knows what ojas is. Some Ayurveda, they call it the physiological expression of consciousness, that we actually are sort of refining this food into such a refined fluid, it becomes you know, somehow close and resonating in vibration with consciousness only if it's been fed with a sattvic experience of life. If it's been fed with a violent, aggressive, competitive, driven, you know, angry experience of life, we wonder how much of that ojas is actually made. And, and that, believe it or not, that is one of the goals of Ayurveda is to experience the physiological expression of consciousness which allows us to have better success at being more aware, more aware of our own consciousness, more aware of the difference between the truth and the non-truth, truth being your true nature it's from that sattvic place, non-truth being what your mind thinks you need to be happy. I need a new car. I need a Starbucks coffee. I need some chocolate. I need to go shopping. These are the things that are the non-truth because we all know it's non-truth, but we are sort of locked into it. We have to do it because we do it. So that is the game of life. And it's all played through on the board of the Rasayana or the board of your lymphatic system, which I think is just fascinating. Um, and a lot of that science hasn't been proven, but a, a lot of it, like I said, is going in that direction. I believe, and I could be way, going way out on a limb here, but I think that, you know, you have microbes on your skin right now, right? You can't see them. We've never been able to see these microbes are too microscopic, right? So is it possible? And if these microbes are, and I'm really theorizing here, so bear with me. If these microbes are multiplying so rapidly, up to a million times in eight hours, right? Is it possible that they are also evolving? Our brain tripled the size in the last two million years. That's evolving. We're upright. Lots of amazing things have happened to us physically. Is it impossible that we've also evolved mentally, spiritually, and emotionally? And since 90% of our cells are microbes, is it crazy to think that those microbes have also evolved to hold on to? And, be, and we know that they're so sensitive to subtleties like emotions. That's been documented. Is it impossible to think that the microbes have evolved in a sattvic, loving, giving, caring environment to support higher levels of consciousness? Am I crazy to think that? I don't have the science to prove that, but I love where science is going. That's what Ayurveda says. They didn't recognize those microbes, but I think that that's what we're looking at is higher, higher, a higher vibrational experience possibly from 
uh, our microbiology. We don't know that for sure yet, but it's pretty interesting. So there's some pretty cool things to do for your lymphatic system before I uh, get too long-winded here about your lymph. And uh, some of the things that are great to do for your lymph, of course, are uh, uh, exercise is very important. I had, a, she had a patient just today who, who had some really bloated lymphatic congestion on her belly and, and she spent her whole lifetime with stomach aches and stomach pain. And the one thing that helped her in her entire life was exercise. She finally started exercising and that pushed the lymph system and took the stress off her gut. And now she's sort of addicted to exercise and that makes her feel better. And my job is to you know, we may now help fix the underlying digestive imbalance so she's not dependent on the exercise, but it's lymph that is driven by exercise. I'm a big fan of, of nasal breathing. When you breathe through your nose, uh, the nose goes all air goes through the nose through these like turbines in your nose, turbinates in your nose or turbines that drive the air all the way down into the lower lobes of your lungs. And in the lower lobes of your lungs, you have uh, a, a, a nerve down there called the vagus nerve. And when you deep breathe, you activate a vagal response. In our study with my nasal breathing exercise book, Body, Mind, and Sport, they flipped the brain into an alpha state, and athletes were able to perform higher levels of work with less stress and brain waves that were akin exactly like meditative brain waves. So imagine running as fast as you could with your brain in a meditative state. That will allow you now to handle stress without the wear and tear. Lymph loves that. That is like, you know, music to the lymph's ears. To be dynamically active and pumping all this lymph without the stress degenerative chemistry. The lymph is like, you know, give me all that all day long because that's what the lymph needs. The lymph needs exercise to move, but if you tie it with stress and push and, and hurt and, and break your body down to build yourself up, then the lymph becomes you know, uh, it has to deal with the, the wear and tear, the free radical damage that the exercise produces. So we were able to actually show that you could actually reproduce sort of runner's high zone-like experiences of comfort during exercise. So one of the goals was to be calm in the midst of the dynamic activity. Nasal breathing exercise, I've written a ton about it, hugely important. We've got a workout called the short uh, or the 12-minute workout. Please, you know, like you know, there's over 400 videos and articles on my website all about this stuff. It's free, it's great information there for your lymph. Please go there. Uh, and go to the exercise fitness section to get some of this nasal breathing stuff, because I'm not sure it's in the lymph section. Um, uh, meditation, right? We know that stress causes the microbes to, you know, to become problematic, and we know it affects your, your intestinal wall, we know it, it affects the production of microbes and the function of your lymphatic system. We know that stress becomes, causes an acidity in the body, and that also compromises lymphatic system. We know that stress tells the body to store fat and burn sugar, which also compromises lymphatic flow. We know that when you are burning fat, which is a calm fuel, stable fuel, non-emergency fuel, guess what? Your lymph system moves better, you detoxify better. In that regard, you burn fat better. So when you are uh, exercising, you in, from a calm place, you're gonna burn fat better, right? If you're killing yourself in the workout, you're gonna burn sugar and store fat or burn fat less efficiently. And there's good science behind that. Meditation, the most powerful way to de-stress, okay? studies, and, I'm, and I just wrote an article that's coming out very soon about meditation and the length of the telomeres. The telomeres are these chromosomal caps that when they get short under wear and tear and aging, it means you're aging faster. And if they're longer, you're more youthful and younger. And there are things you can do to make your telomeres longer, like good health, a good diet, proper exercise, meditation, and there's things that actually shorten it, like super stress. So all the things we just talked about, being aggressive and not sattvic, has been shown to actually shorten your telomeres and shorten your life and is linked to the expression or the, the succumbing of more diseases or degenerative conditions. So when they study, so they now we know, right, the shorter your telomeres is related to aging, accelerated aging. They took like 58 women, half the group were super stressed and half the group were non-stressed. The group that were super stressed had shortened telomeres to the tune of 10 years of accelerated aging. Then they said, let's give these, give, give a group of people meditation and teach them how to meditate. 
And they found out in one study, and you can read about the details and, and the research behind it, one group had an increase of telomerase, like telomere lengthening enzymes, by 40%, 43% in one study and 30% in another. So meditation is hugely important for your lymphatic flow. Again, it sort of creates that calm so the lymph can flow without all the stress. Stress is not good, not a good thing. So, um, and we have, if you don't meditate, and you know, I'm all about you know, using meditation and Ayurveda as an awareness tool to make transformational action in your life and change your life. So you don't carry the same old emotional patterns, do the same dumb stuff again and again and again. And trust me, your emotions take out your lymph. It's a big deal. We have a technique called the Transformational Awareness Technique, six meditations to emotional freedom. It's an online course. It takes six weeks to go through it. It teaches you how to meditate, six different meditations. So, so no matter where you are, in your meditation practice, there's gonna be a meditation that you can accomplish and have success with, and then I teach you how to, what to do to take transformational action to finish the job that the meditation provides the awareness of. So once you have the awareness, you must act. So that's hugely, hugely important as well. Other things for your skin, like the daily skin brushing, exfoliating, super good for your skin, and then put the oil on it so you feed the bugs. Very, very important. Uh, other things, sipping. Uh, this is crazy. People don't understand it. I don't even really understand why this works so well, but it does. It's an old Ayurvedic recipe of sipping hot water every every 10 to 15 minutes for about two weeks, not while you're sleeping, but throughout the day. And that sipping water has a vasodilation effect. It's very, very powerful. Um, and it's almost like pouring hot water on leather. If you're dehydrated, it softens the leather and the tissues begin to support hydration better. And that's really, really good for the lymph. Herbs that are great for the lymph. Uh, my favorite herb, mangista, is a lymphatic mover. Studies have shown that mangista is a powerful antioxidant. It's been shown to protect um, the cells from in the liver and in your fat cells, which move through your lymphatic system. It protects them from oxidation. So if you're absorbing toxic fats through your lymphatic system, that system be more vulnerable to congestion. But Mangista has been studied to protect those fats so they don't oxidize and therefore allow the lymph system to flow better. It's a powerful uh, support for the, the liver uh, and the lymph as well as your blood. So that's a very important one. The white part of the orange in the grapefruit, you know, they Ayurveda knew for forever that eat the white part of the pomegranate, the white part of the grapefruit, the white part of the orange, that's where all the medicine is. Now we know there's this, herb, this chemical called diosmin, which supports microcirculation for venous drainage, for lymph drainage, for cellulite, um, and a very, very important uh, constituent. And it's just the one, we have a product called lymphane, and it's just the extract of orange peel. So when you're eating your grapefruit next time, you know, and you peel it, don't take peel off all the white and eat that too. It's not as tasty, but the benefits there, that's where the good stuff is. That's where the juice is. And maybe the last and maybe most, most shocking herb for the lymph is an herb called Brahmi, Centella asiatica. We always thought that was the herb for mental clarity and so many studies on its ability to create mood stability, not be startled under stress, decrease anxiety. So many great studies on Brahmi for the brain. And we have a product called Brahmi Brain for that. New studies show that that herb heals, supports the function of the skin. It creates protection of the lining of your stomach. And then another study came out showing that it actually supports the function of your lymphatic system. People who go and they travel on an airplane and they get swollen in their ankles, people who have taken Brahmi like two days before, during, and two days after had little to no swelling compared to the control group that has significant amount of swelling. Um, so, so it, it, another herb for microcirculation, and the microcirculation is that very minor circulation in between the cells. And boy, since we have so many of those cells, you know that's where uh, that's where it all happens. So it's very, very important. Of course, uh, your leafy greens. I always say half your plate should be uh, vegetables. You can cook them more in the winter. You have a little bit less cooked in the summer and the spring, but definitely make sure you get your vegetables because those greens provide the, the, they actually provide proteins that support the production of certain lymphocytes. 
We know that. There's good, I've written articles about that. So we know that leafy greens are loaded with this protein that helps make the lymphocytes that we need to get the lymph to move. So we know there's a direct relationship. It's not just the fact that the greens are alkaline and that helps lymph flow. There's actually proteins in the greens that make uh, our lymph system better and stronger. So how cool is all that? I hope I didn't uh, confuse you. I've got some, uh, some questions here uh, uh, from on the lymphatic system here somewhere. Um, do you know where my questions are, Tana? Are they right, is that right, them right there? Okay, cool. I'm going to kind of go through some questions here. Um, uh, when I think about how the blood and lymph connect, I'm curious uh, how menstruation impacts the lymphatic system. I think pretty dramatically, hugely dramatically. Okay, here's an. I wrote an article called. Uh, this is about lymph and menstruation. It was called. Uh, what was it called? it might not be hormonal, okay? So go to the Women's Health section of my our website and read that article. Your, our reproductive system drains through internally through the menstrual, through the lymphatic system, through the gut-associated lymph. If the menstrual system is congested or the lymphatic system around the gut is boggy because of constipation and stress and inflammation in your gut, then the lymph around the gut is going to be boggy, and when you menstruate, that drainage of lymph through the, the of, of waste, reproductive waste through the lymph, could become congested. Prior to menstruation, for about two weeks, there's an internal detoxification that's taking place internally before the menstruation through the lymphatic system. And if the lymph system is congested and you're dumping waste into an already congested system, it can make your belly bloat. It can make your skin break out. It can make your breast swell and become tender, make you hold on to more water. It can make you kind of moody and crazy too, because that's what the lymph does. So if you have any of those premenstrual symptoms where you're prior to the cycle feeling bloated and heavy and breast swelling and tenderness, that could be a lymphatic congestion. And thus the article, it might not be hormonal because it might actually be a drainage system of your reproductive system that's congested toxins backing up into the reproductive system, and then the onus of detoxing, everything goes on the menstrual process, can overwhelm it, make cramps, heavy cycle, and create real problems. So that's something that uh, is very, very, really, you know, an important understanding. So the herb like, and then I wrote that article because I had so much success with a simple herb called Mangista. I give women the Mangista, they take it, and in an ordinate amount of time, their, their uh, reproductive issues, you know, get better, which I thought was really compelling evidence to, to suggest that, that, um, that the lymph had a whole lot to do with some of the reproductive issues. Even fibroids and things like that are just, you know, congestion in the muscle. And if the muscle can't drain its lymph, it starts to create congestion inside the muscle, and that's what a fibroid is. So sister the same way. So these are really, you know, very simple, logical, but fascinating, fascinating uh, understanding of how the lymph uh, works. Uh, my understanding is that the moon has quite an impact on rivers and especially oceans. We've seen the moon influences on plants and, and, and behavior of humans. What is, what is the influence around the lymph? That is a great question. There's no doubt that that is the fluid in our body. And there's no doubt that that fluid is affected by the moon. And many people are dramatically affected by the moon. Um, and I think that when we, we, and we definitely link fluid of lymph to our mood stability. That's a very strong connection in Ayurveda. And the, does the moon affect the flow of the lymph? It's very, very possible. I don't have any science, but I think that'd be a great, a great study. My, my husband is 35 years old, has gastritis. He got an allergy to dairy, never had before dry eyes. What do you think his, uh, his vista is messed up? I don't know what is, um, but I think when you have a situation where you have gastritis, that's a stomach inflammation issue. You don't always go right and say it's lymph, but the, theoretically, the lymph was the first detoxification system. When that kind of went wacky, toxins defaulted back to the liver. Liver affects bile flow. Bile flow directly affects gastric acid production because it's the buffer for that acid. So no buffers no acid, or the acid doesn't want to leave the stomach because there's no buffers for it down below. So it stays in your stomach and causes a burn or an irritation or, or something like that. Uh, my body has Lyme disease. 
I'm using a sea salt and vitamin C protocol with 75% veggies, pure water to detox and heal. So far, great, except my lymphatic system is to, from time to time to get clogged. I feel heavy legs, sore groin in my back. I've been doing skin brushing, infrared sauna, drinking pure water, making sure I eat plenty of potassium foods, doing standing calf raises, uh, at times jumping very high, you know, like the, the, the rebounder jumping, uh, being inverted, you know, uh, BKS Iyengar, who recently passed away, who created Iyengar Yoga, his favorite, and said the number one yoga posture that, gave, that he creates cred, credits all of his health to, and he was like the 95 when he passed, uh, was headstands, you know, a lymph draining exercise. Uh, all the things that I mentioned, the herbs that have to be looked at, the, the proper exercise, the short home cleanse exercise uses fast twitch versus slow twitch exercise. Fast twitch activates the spindles of the muscles, and in the spindles of your muscles is the lymphatic vessels, sort of like in here, the muscles, there's the lymph in there. And if you don't get those guys moving, the muscles, then that lymph never sometimes gets moving. So fast twitch fiber exercise, the short, the, the 12 minute workout, that could be something. And it could be as simple as, you know, taking tuna fish cans and going like this for a minute. Watch that video, you'll love it. It doesn't require like, you know, you have to be super athletic or anything. It could be very easy. It could be as simple as, as jumping jacks, you know what I mean? Um, so that's something that's very important. I'm concerned about the water available to me. I buy bottled water, boy, but it's in a plastic container. I have emergency concern about the shower, tub, sink, or are there things you can do? Well, definitely get a, a, a filter, a carbon filter for your shower, carbon filter for your sink, and that is the first thing to do. If you want to get really fancy, boil that water, um, and then you're, you're, you're probably looking at something closer to the best water. Uh, if you can get glass bottled spring water to deliver, that's probably the best because... Um, but even that has been UV radiated too. So, I, you know, but I'm not a fan of reverse osmosis water because everything has been taken out. And I feel like um, we don't know enough about that. And I feel like it's sort of like processed water. And I think we just avoid, you know, try to get as close to non-processed as possible. And that's why I think, you know, either a good carbon filter or spring water is the best way to go. Breathing through the nose seems to be difficult to learn. I feel like I don't get enough oxygen. I can't breathe when I try it. There's always some mucus in my nose uh, and my mouth is easier. Yes, um, mucus is natural in the beginning. We have a nausea oil. You can put it's herbalized, put a couple of drops in your nose, sniff it in your sinuses. That will lubricate your nose before you actually go out and exercise or go for a walk or a hike with nasal breathing. Very, very valuable, but get you can definitely, and, and usually that wears off, and usually about three weeks of learning how to nose breathe, it helps get you to have full respiratory capacity in the lower lobes of your lungs, and many of us don't have that. So it is a process, that's why it's so powerful, because most people stink at breathing, and, 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 I, and I really should do a whole webinar on just the mechanics of breathing, because it's fascinating. Um, and I will be doing way more talking about exercising and nasal breathing and the value of that because the research that we did way back then in body mind sport, I, I, I've just recently read our reread our study and I'm just it's amazing what we what we actually proved and, and, and we everybody should learn to breathe through your nose. Uh, eight years ago, I had 16 lymph nodes removed due to breast cancer. This really affected my right arm as well as my entire lymphatic system. In addition to regular lymphatic massage and seasonal cleansing, what other things can I do uh, for my arm from swelling and aching? Well, you know, you, 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 the things you can do, I think the hot water, some of the herbs that I mentioned, exercise. You can try the fast twitch exercise, like, you know, just jumping jacks for the short, the 12 minute workout is a two minute warm up. A one minute sprint, one minute cool down, nasal breathing, and do that four times with a two minute cool down. Super simple. But the but the sprint is a fast twitch fiber. It could be a minute of jumping jacks would be so good for your lymph and your arms, or even just punching or like I said, lifting tuna fish cans. It doesn't really matter, but you gotta do fast twitch fiber because that's what demands the muscles to contract and breaks up that lymph and gets those muscles to begin to move again. There's probably a lot of scar tissue that's fibrousy and sticky in your muscles and they can't contract and they can't slide. You know, getting lymph massage, also a technique called deep massage or active release technique to go into those tissues and actually break up the scar tissue in between the muscles and that will allow the lymph to flow, uh, to flow better as well. Um, 
Um, why is Brahmi brain listed with Mangista and Lymphane as lymph-related product? Well, I think I already, I already talked to you about that because there's all, there, all of them have really good research to support lymphatic drainage. Uh, they all are lymph movers. Uh, what is the best exercise for lymph? Any exercise is good for the lymph. Um, uh, honking or hiking or a elliptical machine, uh, jumping on a trampoline may be the best actually, or a mini tramp, because that uses all that pumping action, is very, very good as well. And a mini tramp is super easy because it's very non, uh, you know, aggressive and it, it doesn't hurt your joints at all. Um, please advise how to care for my lymph when the gallbladder has been removed. Um, you know, really the same way. Your gallbladder uh, and everything is connected to your lymph, but you know, without the gallbladder, you just have to make sure that you keep your liver happy so it can make the lymph, the bile on demand. That's the key. Uh, and of course, if you have a lot of lymphatic congestion, then you're gonna get a lot of extra toxins going back to your liver, making the liver more congested, making the bile more congested, which may have been why the gallbladder kind of went wacky in the first place. So you wanna go back and get that lymph to, to move. And, and, and I've written a bunch of articles about the lymph and you can go through those, those sort of signs that the lymph is you know, congested. Do I have rings that tattoo my fingers, rashes, eczema, itchiness, those are lymph conditions I didn't mention, and all the other allergies, sinuses, tiredness, all those things as well. Let's go and see on the phones, if anybody's on the phone, um, uh, there's one call here. If you want to ask a question, push star two, and we're just going to sort of wrap this up, and then we're going to go to the next part of our call here. Um, so uh, in uh, Washington, Virginia, are you there? Yes, John, I'm here. Great. How you doing? Wonderful. So what's up? I, I was wondering about the, the breath. I just finished a retreat in Northern California and with some folks that you're quite close to, you've done some stuff with, and they have a lot of breathing where it's open mouth breathing. And I'm just wondering if you have an opinion about why so many of their exercises would be open mouth breathing versus the nostril breathing. Well, I think that... Um, when you, I, I, you can do techniques like rebirthing techniques with your mouth open that um, trigger a kind of a, um, a um, uh, um, hyperventilation a, a lot quicker that way. It's very, very difficult to hyperventilate with your mouth closed. And therefore, when you hyperventilate, <coughs> you, um, you build up um, a lot of CO2 in the body and that creates sort of uh, a, a disarming of the oxygenation to the brain, and then the brain sort of slips into a sort of a you know a disarmed, unprotective state. So you gain access at a deeper level. You can get similar transformational changes like that with nasal breathing. It just takes a lot longer, um, and you know uh, it's a lot less. Those techniques can be very very aggressive, and they need to be under, done under supervision and you know, those kinds of things. But, you know, for the regular person, you know, just to support physiological function, moving prone into the brain, um, the nasal breathing, I, I think, works better. You, know, you could almost say that there are some medicinal techniques that could be done with the mouth open, but that's not the kind of thing you want to do all the time. It's sort of, a, it's sort of a, something that you might want to do for a medicinal, a very powerful effect, but, you know, you're, you're building up a lot of toxins in the body, and that's, you have to be careful, very careful. Well, if anybody didn't ask, it'd be you. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Okay, let me go to, um, uh, yes, here. Um, let's see here. Are the lymph drainage, um, are lymph drainage treatments in a spa a good idea? If so, how many times a year? Um, yeah, I mean, those lymphatic massage techniques are great. I think that the key, in my mind, is to get an understanding, because that's the skin-associated lymph. The lymph starts deep inside with your digestion and your stress and your microbes, you know, like 
even the taste and smell of the food. So it's so deep that we have to look at it more globally and not just look at this might be sort of symptomatic relief and really potentially a very good therapy, but at the same time, I'd go deep and figure out what's causing it. I'm sure those limb therapists are all about, you know, <clears throat> digging deep and understanding the reason why it's congested and not just looking at doing massage and shoveling out, you know, the lymph when it gets congested. Um, so that's that. Uh, let's see, any more questions? Um, I have maybe one more question. Um, hi, I'm close to menopause. This is a way to postpone menopause um, and experience lots of hot flashes and sweats. <clears throat> How do I best relieve this and bump up estrogen naturally? What do you think of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? Um, and, um, okay, that isn't really a super lymph question, but I, but I can tie that to the lymph in that um, when the lymph system gets congested, and we know that we have menstrual fluid draining through the lymph, the gut-associated lymph, if that's not working well, those toxins are going to default back to the liver. When they go to the liver, in the Ayurvedic perspective, it causes heat and toxicity to build up in the liver, and that is what is classically behind the hot flash. So we look at those hot flash symptoms as liver congested issues, okay? And then that the liver gets hot, the blood gets hot, and we have you have we kind of acidic or heat related issues as a result of that. Um, when you're under a lot of stress, the body, the adrenals will borrow progesterone and testosterone from the reproductive system, and that can leave the 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 uh, hormonal those reproductive hormones depleted around the time of menopause if there's been a lot of stress, you know, kind of up to the point of menopause. So that's where you want to take herbs that kind of not give you the hormones. I don't think it's the best first step. I would say, let's get the lymph to drain so, the, so it's not, a, and not a, a, a lymph congestive thing, you know, it might not be hormonal. Um, but there's herbs like shatavari, which means a woman with a hundred husbands, or, or, or one good one, they say, which is a precursor to all the female reproductive hormones. Ashwagandha, a precursor, means the strength of 10 horses, a precursor to the testosterone, which has to do with sex drive. And those two can be great rebuilders and rebooters for the stress, and therefore, and that with Mangista to support lymphatic flow, you might actually not need any HRT at all. And that's the cool thing I think what Ayurveda does. Let's get the body to do this. And if that doesn't work, well, then we move on and get the help we need. But, if we, but let's try to get the body involved before we throw in the towel and use either herbs to do the job for the body or even Western medicines to do the job for the body. Ayurveda is all about let's get the body and see if we can get the body to bring itself back into balance and do the healing of the job uh, for itself. That's pretty cool. I'm going to shift gears. Thank you all very much. Uh, the next part of this call is going to be about the, um, the Colorado cleanse. And uh, we had a bunch of questions about the Colorado cleanse. Do you have those? Thank you so much. Um, so a couple of questions I want to answer. Uh, and as you know, our Colorado cleanse is coming up uh, in October 14th. And y you can do the Colorado cleanse anytime that you want. Uh, we have a whole beautiful book here. You can actually do it step by step through the book. It tells you exactly how to do it. It's super easy. But twice a year, we do it as a group where we have emails every morning. There's conference calls. There's a live question and answer sections. There's lectures. There's an online forum to communicate with sometimes five, six, seven, eight hundred people from all over the world. So you feel like you're part of a community and you're cleansing and, um, and it helps. And we kind of hold your hand through the process and it's a real fun group effort. Um, uh, so that starts October 14th, but you can always do the Colorado cleanse on your own. It's a two week, which makes it different. It's a digestive reset. Before you just go and pull toxins out of the fat cells, you want to make sure that you know why the body put it in the fat cells in the first place, usually because it didn't know what else to do with those toxins. So if we can reboot digestive and detox strength first, make the body a better digester, a better natural detoxer, and then go pull those toxins out, we create a permanent effect a permanent boosting of our digestive strength and a permanent uh, or more, a more lasting benefit in terms of your ability to detoxify. And that's what makes the Colorado cleanse so special. And we've been doing it for years and um, the benefits are just off the charts. It's a two week cleanse and uh, you can eat three meals a day the whole time. So you're not, there's nothing about starving here. Um, uh, we, we make you eat good, healthy food, but you're eating three meals a day the entire time. Um, so, on the web or 
on the phone. On the call. On the call. Can you dial it up again? Yeah. So hang on one second. We lost the contact. Or do you have that number real quick? I can do it. Yes. We lost the contact um, with our phone. So let me just dial that in real quick. Um, Welcome to the conference. Please enter the conference ID followed by the pound key. Thank you. Moderator ID accepted. All guests are currently muted. To unmute all guests, press 99. For help with host options, press star we're 0. Back. We will now be connected with the conference. Okay, so we're back. Sorry for that. Um, just, I was just giving a little intro to the, um, to the Colorado Cleanse. And um, if the two-week cleanse is just too much for you, then we have our, our free short home cleanse ebook, which is like, you know, download it for free and tells you how to do a short four-day four cleanse. Definitely think of or consider something uh, as the seasons change here um, this fall. So that's really important. Let me answer some questions about the, the Colorado cleanse. Uh, hi, Dr. Driard. Uh, is the fall cleanse the same as the spring cleanse for those living in the Southern Hemisphere? Absolutely. It's just the exact opposite. Um, so, um, yep, that's great. Uh, is this an appropriate cleanse for me? I never have had good digestion. Um, at 19, I was having two bowel movements per month. I've done a lot of cleansing, food combining, colonics. I'm 41, but my digestion is still very bad. Once a week, if I'm lucky, thank you. Um, you know, like I just said a minute ago, the most important thing about the chiral cleanse is to reset digestion. If you don't do that, you know, we know, like we just talked about, stress, it pounds through our gut, takes out our good bugs, takes our ability to digest. The villi become dry. They can't make good microbes. They, or, and and we, our intestinal tract can dry out or produce excess reactive mucus and make us, give us looser stools. That congestion congests your lymph and creates all kinds of allergic reactive symptoms. And what's worse is the toxins default back to your liver and they congest your liver they thicken your bile and your bile is who is in charge of regulating your poop your regularity comes from bile flow and that's why it's so important to understand how this whole thing works because if that congestion dryness or because of excess stress in your gut has dried out your gut and then congested your lymph and then defaulted back to your liver and now your liver bile flow is congested you won't go to the bathroom well so the point is to let's get that lymph to move, let's heal repair the intestinal tract, and let's bring this whole thing back into balance. I would highly suggest that that you know um, that the cleanse is going to be a great kickstart. I would love to sort of work with you about this and guide you through this process. So I really get those job done because that's the challenge I like when someone hasn't pooped in a month or whatever, or now once a week. We can we can bring it back the rest of the way, and, and hopefully at the end of the day, not be dependent on so many pills and powders and things to do to to keep you regular, like colonics and all that. Uh, there's so much we can do. This is my first cleanse and reset. Three weeks ago, I had a sigmoid colon removed due to a history of severe diverticulosis and infection. Surgeons said that there are no diverticuli in my uh, in my colon. I've been on a soft diet for three weeks. Should it be, be there be any precautions that I would take during the cleanse? All I would say to do, I mean, no, not really, except for the herbs. I would take them just one time a day at the main meal for a couple of days and make sure you're feeling pretty good with that. And then, then ramp it up to twice a day and three times a day. And also I would start on the nourishing diet. Then we have three meal plans. You always eat three meals a day. We have three meal plans that make it really easy for anyone to do it. And you always want to start on the easiest. And if you're feeling good, then you can be more aggressive. Don't be aggressive first and then have to back out, back off. It's way smarter and better to be, um, to be uh, to go easy first and then be aggressive as you go. And that would be the only thing that I would say, just be careful, watch it. We give you lots of caveats to, to what to look out for. And those are some of those things. Um, uh, let's see here um, if I can get any more questions about the Colorado cleanse. If you have any questions about the, um, the Colorado cleanse, please press um, star two to raise your hand. I can talk to you. Um, let's see what we have here. Would I gain more benefit by extending the four day cleanse to seven days? Well, the, you, you can do that. If you want to take the four day cleanse and go seven days, that's sort of what the Colorado cleanse is. 
And what we do with the chiral cleanse is we give you a four day digestive reset before we do seven days of what we call the short home cleanse. We also give you way more ghee to take during that seven days of the, of the chiral cleanse. And the big part of it is to take, to have the digestive uh, boosting benefits before you start. And we ask where the herbs come, a really whole food diet, no wheat, no dairy, no, no nuts, no seafood, things like that that are allergenic are taken out of the diet for those four days as we boost digestive strength. And then the last three days after the seven days are where we really boost the digestive strength with the herbs and we go back on the whole food diet. So, so if you're gonna do the seven days, you might as well bite the bullet because the four days in the beginning and the three days at the end, you're actually eating you know, pretty much to a natural diet, just a really good healthy diet. Most folks, when they finish the chiral cleanse, they go, I feel so good eating this diet, I don't wanna change it. I don't need to go back and eat you know, pastas and meat and things. I'm feeling so good eating in this clean way. So you won't feel in any way deprived by doing the, if you're gonna do seven days of short cleanse, you might as well go for the, for the 14 days and get the full benefit of the digestive reset is what, uh, is what I would suggest. Okay, um, one last question about the, about, the, uh, about the Colorado cleanse, and that is, um, you know, are there, are there any um, issues related to uh, not having a gallbladder? And, and we hear that question a lot, uh, you know, or if I have gallbladder discomfort. And you know, you should always make sure that you check with your doctor before doing the cholesterol cleanse and or any cleanse for that matter. But you know, people who don't have a gallbladder are still making bile through their liver. And it's very important that we support the function and, and the production of bile from the liver. And, and that's where this lecture about the lymph is so important because most people who have liver congestive bile flow issues, their gallbladder move, that started with years as a kid with swollen glands and sore throats and earaches and eczema and, and, and colds or frequent colds. That's all that was brewing, constipation things. And then down the road, that brewed into inability to digest fats and then become congested. So we want to do the lymph thing, but also support the uh, the beet the the bile flow and that's we have an herb called beet cleanse we give you the green drink the beets that you take the apples we are all and the ghee you take every morning I mean we are going so directly after the bile to get that to move and and, and you, you you use those in a very kind gentle way to either decongest your gallbladder your bile or your liver all right everyone thank you so much for listening thank you for joining me if you have any other questions about the Colorado cleanse uh, please you know, give us a call or email us at john at lifespa.com or check out or watch. I've done some videos on the Colorado Cleanse, a whole hour long about, uh, about what the Colorado Cleanse is and how it's different and special. And you can get that at lifespa.com. Thanks for listening.